Um, Sanjeev, the book, India in the Age of Ideas, is sort of a panoramic set of writings on many different issues. It covers the gamut from religion to the economy. But I want to start um, with something that actually may touch a nerve here. There are at least two chapters in the book that are about India's elites. And there is nothing more elite, I think, than the Quorum Club. So I think, I think we should start by talking about elitism. There is a kind of global pushback against elites. I think the Americans have had to cope with it. I think the rise of populist strongmen have a lot to do uh, with the sort of echo chambers that elites have typically occupied. And you spend a considerable amount of time uh, on this. Talk a little bit about how you perceive India's elites. They're traditional monopoly over certain sets of narratives and why that is perhaps under irrevocable sort of threat today. So uh, let me begin by saying it's uh, wonderful to be here. It's the first time I've come to the Quorum, although I've been to Gurgaon many, many times and I've lived here as well. Um, um, as was said earlier, I'm here as a writer. Um, I'm not shy usually of my opinions on various things, but because the, of the model code of conduct, I may have to be a little careful about saying anything that's directly political. Sure. I'm happy to, uh, you know, exchange ideas, ideologies and things like that. But, you know, don't ask me um, what I think of what the… the we won't the, ask the, you what you think the, of Rahul Gandhi. Or, or for that matter, what the outcome of the elections will be. Sure. Or, or, you know, certain things which may or may not be there in the manifestos of different parties. Sure. I can't comment on that by okay. law. Um, now, for the specific issue on elites. Now, this book, incidentally, is um, a collection of articles. Mm -hmm. And I basically began to make, uh, write about uh, elites. This has only got two or three of those articles. But I have, in my other writings as well, I talk about elites. And these are interestingly written about a decade ago when I was, in fact, living in ambience further up the road. Um, and the point I was making there is that we had a very peculiar uh, country that was, in theory, um, uh, in theory, it was a democracy. Uh, in theory, we had shifted from socialism to capitalism. But we had this situation where we had an extremely tiny group of people, maybe a few hundred families, which effectively controlled this country in every field. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you go back and look at who were the top um, uh, businessmen or uh, 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 industrialists in 1947, and till very recently, till certainly into the 90s, the list would be, with the one exception of the Ambani's, be mm -hmm. pretty much the same. Now, that sort of changed with one round uh, of iteration because of the entry of the uh, uh, IT uh, people. Mm -hmm. But that was pretty much it. Now, you, you have a similar thing with the lawyer community, where you have a similar thing with Bollywood. All of this is now beginning to crumble. So, but inherited wealth, inherited inher power, yes. inherited professions. And over time, much of it intermarried. So, <laughs> so the net result of which was quite interesting to me because as a historian, this is the sort of thing that has happened in other societies at a certain point in them. Like, so if you went back uh, and look at uh, the British history and the aristocrats in the early 19th century, it was very, very similar to that. Uh, if you looked at America in the late 19th century, there's a book called the Gilded, about the Gilded Age. And it was the same thing. There was a very tiny group of people who basically dominated uh, all these. And mm -hmm. the point I was making is that at some point in time, a newly emerging middle class, and I'm not talking about the middle class from which at least I am drawn from, which is the old middle class. I'm talking about a newly emerging middle class at some point begins to challenge this group. And in every single time, uh, you have consequently major socio-political uh, churn, churn as a result of this. So in Britain, what happened is in the 1830s, uh, this same phenomena happened and as a result of which you had, of course, many demonstrations and so on, ultimately resulting in something called the Great Reform Act of 1832, by which power shifted from the House of Lords to the House of Commons. Same thing happens in America in the 1890s with something called the Progressive Movement. Uh, when power shifts, um, again, same thing, you know, the, the Rockefellers and Vanderbilts and so on control everything and then you have Teddy Roosevelt who turns up, he breaks down the monopolies and trusts, and you have this churn again. And so 
20th century America is the creation of Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. So I was basically making the point that, look, this has happened everywhere. It's also happened in Asia, this, you know, 1988 in South Korea, the middle class rises and pushes back against the, the Chebol uh, uh, businessman. So something like that was likely to happen. Now, I didn't realize that in, in writing all of this in 2010, that this is precisely what would happen within a few years. Well, remember, it was not very obvious at that time. But I would argue that that dynamic Mm -hmm. was already in motion. Already in motion. And so, uh, what we are now seeing as a result of this is this massive pushback happening at multiple levels. And I think it's a good thing be because it allows for flow. Uh, but very importantly, what is important to recognize here is the history of this is very different where there's democracy and where there's no democracy. Hmm. So, in democratic systems, uh, churn by and large happens peacefully. But where there is no outlet for this, you have revolution. So the French Revolution wasn't the peasants rising in revolt. Mm -hmm. It was the middle class of Paris that rose in revolt.